get a email, this is about over two years ago, happened to get an email saying, hey, go check out, there's this program called Batman is You out at St. Uh, Francis of Assisi, go check it out. Um, and I think I had a couple appointments that, that night at my office that canceled, and my <laughs> wife and kids were already planning to do something else for the evening, and I ended up out at, I'm not sure how I ended up out there, as divine intervention, really. Uh, several of you in the room were there. George, uh, there's a few others I think that were probably here to go see. A gentleman by the name of Bo Iskey, uh, who coincidentally happens to be an agent for the same insurance company that I'm associated with. And so, and I thought, oh, well, this, is, this is a sign here. We gotta go back and start this program up at St. Pius. And about that time, <clears throat> Dean and I had coached uh, basketball together, youth basketball, and we started talking about doing a father's group. Um, and uh, had a father's group together for about a year and decided, you know what, this, that man is you would be perfect, uh, really. And, and I, I think uh, it's a wonderful compliment uh, to man up. It would be something that you should seriously consider taking to your parishes and starting up a that man is you. It's a, it's a, it's a very well-run program out of Houston by a group called Paradisus Day. Um, and uh, don't want to take up a lot of time because I want to be able to allow you guys to experience what we experience every Friday morning. Um, very well put together, a uh, very foolproof process that you put together a core group and bring that man as you to your parish. Um, uh, we'll get more information out to you as a follow-up as they typically have follow-ups to, to these man-ups. That way we don't bombard you with too much information. You get a little sampling of the bulletin insert we used. Um, and a few other things there, but we've got uh, also our facilitator notes. Dean's going to take you through some some uh, a topic that he normally goes through as we begin on our Friday mornings for that man as you, uh, and then we'll, we'll after the DVD program we'll end up with uh, our table discussion, just how we do it on Friday morning. So you get a little sampling here of, uh, of what that man as you is all about, and uh, it's been a pleasure to have this year Chris Chris Lang and, and um, Tim. Meyer uh, be part of our group, uh, and uh, I think they've gotten a lot out of it too and have enjoyed it, and uh, when it was St. Pius' turn to have the program, he suggested we, we do a little sampling here, so that's what we got going. So I'm going to turn it over to Steve Swenson, who's going to give us a little bit of a testimonial um, for what that man is you has meant to him. All right, I'm going to try and do it without the microphone. Um, but yeah, I got involved with that man is you is Mike Reesburg, if you know him at all, just like, hey, I'm doing that man as you, I'm on the core team, I want you to be there as well. The reason why I invite you is you're a person I like to hang out with, so it's that simple. Um, obviously, like a lot of you, you go to church, you hear about this, you hear about Man Up, you hear about this program, that program, but this one sounded really good to me. It's a very common sense, a very easy way to come together with guys about the same age, about the same life skills and experiences, and you come together and you learn more about what you should be doing as a father, about what you should be doing as a husband. And it's in a way, it's not, bam, 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 you know, beat me on the head. It's very common sense, easy way of going about it. And after a year of it, I'm doing things differently than I used to do and thinking differently than I used to do. Is it you know, a life-changing program? Not necessarily, but it's not not necessarily that. Okay? I've gotten a lot out of it. I'm now part of the core team and one of the table leaders. And I think I've grown a lot in my faith in the last year because of this program. It's a very good program. I don't mind getting up early in the morning, so it's not a big deal. So, very happy to do it, and it's a good time on Friday mornings, and I actually have very much come to where I am looking forward to Friday mornings. That's all that. I don't think I need a microphone. Can everybody hear me? <laughs> I got a booming teacher voice, my wife says I talk too loud, so. Uh, what I'm here to do is I'm going to lead you through on the MC of the group. And what I try to do each week is what you have in front of you is table notes. Um, but in addition to those table notes this week, I had the rare opportunity, and I, and I just love this, that I got to go see Matthew Kelly. How many people have heard of Matthew Kelly? 
Went up there with a few of my, my brothers, and that man is you. Had a great time this weekend. And something that, there's three things I want to share with you today that I got from that presentation. Uh, before we get into the table notes a little bit. One, he talked something about sit and quit. What does that mean, sit and quit? Well, a couple years ago, probably before my, I met my wife, who's the best thing that's ever happened to me, I was sitting in the church pew, and I was just sitting there. I might as well quit because I didn't know what was going on. Okay? So the first concept was I was sitting and quitting in the pew. Then all of a sudden I met this wonderful woman, had a beautiful marriage, had beautiful kids. And then I, I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, well, I better start to step up as a man. Because now I'm responsible for these kids and responsible for their education and responsible for teaching them about God. And so that's when we talk about a father's suit, that there's a real need. Okay? The second thing that I learned that really made sense to me this weekend was there's a void in all of our hearts, guys. There's a void. And that void is a God void. And if you think about it, we sit there and we go through life and our culture and we try to fill up with things that try to make us happy. Whether it be my, my bad thing is watching the grass football. That makes me happy. Okay? My thing might be having, you know, a couple years ago, I might be having a few beers. Buying into the culture, what it, what it, what it really means. But that, that happiness void never goes away until you start to think about God. And that's what this program also helps you to do, is to think about God. Okay? Third thing I learned, which was kind of, which is kind of cool. This is really cool. And I, I actually attempted to try this today. He talked about the saints. Matthew Kelly talked about the saints. How do you think they became saints? Do you think they were saints to start off with? I mean, we know about St. Peter, St. Paul. Okay? Now, how did, how did they become holy people that people wanted to follow, that people admired so much that they say, these people are saints? They had Catholic moments. And that's what he talked about, is start with one Catholic moment a day. Can you do one Catholic moment each day? And he talked about a universal truth, a universal talent that everybody possesses here in this room and everywhere else in the world, is that we can make this a better place for somebody. We can make it a better place for somebody. So that's what I'm trying to do. Because if you string together one Catholic moment, maybe it's two Catholic moments in a day. And if it becomes three, all of a sudden you're starting to live all these Catholic moments. And all of a sudden you're starting to live a Catholic life. Does that mean you're not going to struggle? Guys, I'm here to tell you I'm a sinner. Okay, I struggle every day sometimes with my patience. Okay? So that's, that's what you have to get back to. Now, Getting back into the session notes for this session, the two become one. This is one of our one of the most favorite discussion groups that, that our men went through in St. Pius. We've already said this. And one of the things I, I talked to them about that day is how many people have said, well, my faith is private. My faith is my faith is private. Get over that. Your faith is not private. If you go to church every Sunday, you sit and celebrate out there in that church with everybody saying that Jesus Christ is your Savior. Your faith is not private, guys. It might be personal, but it's not private. And some of the hardest things, and this is what, this is what I present to the guys, one of the hardest things for me to do is to pray with my wife and my spouse. How many people have trouble with that? I have trouble with that because I'm a man. I have trouble sometimes expressing my feelings. Okay? So as we go through this, one of the things that I suggested to the men to do, and I always offer them a challenge each week, and you see the challenge. Spread at least one day besides Mass, praying with your spouse. There's even a suggested prayer there. Okay, what happens if you don't have a spouse out there? Well, spend that one time praying with somebody that is significant in your life. 
That could be your mother. That could be your brother, your sister, maybe a priest, maybe a good friend. How many people out there know retired people that would love to have people come by their house and sit down and say a Gentlemen, this is what this program is all about. It's, it's talking about authentic leadership for men. In a time when the world says this, and everybody's buying into this world culture, we have to stand up as Catholic men to be different, to go deeper, to discover what the truth really is, and be able to defend that truth. Again, at this time, this is the year of the family. This, that man is you, year two, fits right into the family, and that's what we're going to see in this DVD right now, is that it fits right with the year of the family. And again, like I always tell, tell all the people before, I am so blessed and so lucky to see a room full of men here, and I, and I face a room full of men, 40 to 50 a week sometimes, that come at 5.30 to 7 o'clock in the morning, I feel so lucky, and that energizes me for the week. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me. All right, good morning, and welcome back. And it's amazing how we keep chugging, and we're kind of getting into the middle of it, and uh, this week is a really important one as we look at this union between man and woman. And uh, let's begin ourselves this morning with prayer. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, how good it is for you to bring us together once again this morning. How good it is for you to open our minds and our hearts to this dignity of the human person that transcends anything else on earth. Be with us now. Help us to understand the dignity of the union between man and woman. Expand our hearts so that we may see it as a pathway to encounter you, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Father, and the Son, and the Lord, Amen. All right, well, we are slowly but surely making our way through this first kind of section. If you think back to that whole, you know, temptation of Job, we said the whole first thing was Job was the man who was unlike anything else on earth, and Satan specifically, wanted to go out the best that God had to offer. And we've been talking about how that's humanity. And if you think about what we've done so far, we've looked at just the human dignity in and of itself. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at the dignity of man who lives and reveals on earth the Father of God. Last week, we looked at the dignity of woman with that ultimate mission to order creation to love. And this week, what I'd like to do is now look at the union of man and woman and see that truly there is nothing else on earth like it as well. And of course what we've been doing is we've been going back and we're considering John Paul's insights into that creation of humanity, the image and likeness of God, male and female, and that statement he made that man became the image of God not only through his own humanity, but also through the communion of persons which man and woman formed from the very beginning. The function of the image is that of mirroring the one who is the model, of reproducing its own prototype. Man becomes the image of God not so much in the moment of solitude as in the moment of communion. So John Paul said Christianity has that unique vision of God, that we believe our God is a trinity. Three divine persons who live in such intimate union that there's one God. And John Paul said that's the ultimate understanding we have of God and the ultimate mystery that shed light on everything else, it must shed light on the human person. 
So I looked at that mystery of the Trinity and came up with five steps. That the Father is the principle that has all the principle. He forms an intellectual image of himself, the Word. Together they form, and we're talking about a conception of their love, the Holy Spirit. And then God the Word and God the Spirit, or love, proceed from the bosom of the Father as a unity of the two. The Word is enveloped in love. And then the Word together with the Father, the source of the Spirit. So we've been looking at that definition of the Blessed Trinity as we have been progressing here. And now what I'd like to do is I'd like to take the next step. And I'd like to go back to Maximilian Colby and another one of his statements that he said is he said, God is love. That is it in the Holy Trinity. The ebbing and flowing of love is what constitutes the life found in the bosom of the Holy Trinity. The ebbing and flowing of love. And that is, the Word and the Spirit, so to speak, proceed from the bosom of the Father, so you the two. And in fact, they go back into the Father as a unity of the two. So much so that, you know, when we first looked at this a few weeks back, we looked at those seven last words of Christ from the cross. And we saw that those in a profound way sum up all this, all of Christ's teaching. And that when we came to the very end of those words, the last three words, we said, could be taken as if they were spoken from the very heart of the Blessed Trinity, revealing the life that's in the Blessed Trinity, and that Christ said, I thirst, it is consummated, and into your hands I commend my spirit. So that within the Blessed Trinity, there is this consuming thirst for communion with another person. There is that surrender into, for lack of a better word, the arms of the other person, and there's that consummate union. And we saw that quote from Cardinal Schoenborn, that in fact, that vision of God is so profound we could never come up with it ourselves, but nonetheless, it most fully corresponds to what we have in our own hearts. That is, what God has placed in our hearts. He has given us this thirst to encounter each other, but in encountering each other, to encounter Him. This one flesh union of man and woman, in fact, is called to open so that it takes them beyond this world to actually encounter God. Well, if you look at it, we've looked at these statements a couple of times, so I'm going to go through them quickly, but John Paul is all about man learning what it means to be human. The first meaning of man's original solitude is final, on the basis of a specific test, or examination which man undergoes before God, and in a certain way also before himself. This process also leads to the first delineation of the human being as a human person. So man, Adam, understands that he's different than the rest of visual creation. He's a person. And then John Paul lets us know that to be person means to be called to interpersonal communion. So again, this communion is an essential, and he uses that word, essential part of our being created to the image and likeness of God. Well, if you look at it, this communion of person all happens when after Adam comes to this realization, and after he has this love in his heart, and God pulls this love out of his heart and forms it into a woman, it's at the moment when Adam actually sees the vision of Eve. That he is pulled out of himself and pulled into communion. The Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, it went his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made it to the woman and brought it to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and cleaves to his wife, and they become one flesh. That one flesh union where they will experience the blessing of God is the ultimate last revelation that God has given us in Scripture of what it meant to be human before the fall, of what He intended for us. Which is to say, what He intended 
is for man to be captivated by the vision of woman so profoundly that the man is drawn out of himself into a communion, and a communion that is so profound they become one, and not just one with each other, but together they become one with him. What I'd like to do is consider some science behind that. You know, this whole time what we found is that there are these spiritual mysteries that are being revealed. They're hidden, but they're being revealed precisely, you know, in this life that we live. And if we just pull back the veil a little bit, then what we discover behind this seemingly normal everyday existence that we have is this mystery that makes up our life. We saw that mystery of man, that he cooperates with the Father in order of creation of life. We saw that mystery of woman, who cooperates in a unique way with the Holy Spirit, to help order life to love. Now what we need to do is we need to consider the mystery of their union. Let's start with the man, because he's supposed to be captivated outside of himself by the vision of the woman. And indeed what we find is that men subconsciously seek women with whom they can successfully express their fatherhood. A woman's complexion, her body symmetry, and muscle tone all give indications of her overall health. Furthermore, a woman's hip to waist ratio indicates a sign of her fertility and her ability to bear children. A woman's body adjusts slightly near her ovulation precisely to make her more visually desired to a man right when she can conceive a child, which means right when he can express his fatherhood. <clears throat> Furthermore, a woman's scent gives an indication of her immune system and its compat compatibility to his immune system. And then finally, a kiss provides information about genetics and the immune system. Literally, as a man gazes upon a woman, he is being called out of himself. And in fact, the closer she is to the moment that she can conceive a child, which is to say the closer she is to the moment when he can express his childhood, his fatherhood in and through her, that's precisely when she is more visually attracted to him, so he's being pulled out of himself. He's being pulled out of himself to in fact express the Father, which is to say, order creation to life. When you look at the woman, women seek men with whom they can successfully reproduce and who will provide for the family. A man's complexion, body symmetry, and muscle tone gives indication of his overall health as well. And then his rugged jawline and masculine face give an indication of his testosterone levels. Furthermore, a man's scent and saliva communic communicates genetic information and about his immune system as compatible to her. Finally, a man's money, his success, and his confidence indicate his ability to provide for and protect the family. That mercy, superabundant mercy we talked about. And then near ovulation, a woman's body changes so that she's more attracted to a man, but at the same time, it changes her so that she becomes more talkative and more flirtatious since she is now also more interested in finding union and she's also more discerning at that moment with whom she finds a union because it's not just about wife, it's about love that they will have ever after. Well, then what happens is once a man identifies a woman, and once a woman identifies a man, you get that moment that is that aha moment that sounds amazingly like scripture if you pull back the veil a little bit. You know, once a person falls in love, it activates the reward center in the brain, which is a cut at nucleus. And then the ventral tagmental area, the VTA, has the mother load of all the dopamine producing cells, that enters into heightened state. And that dopamine, again, that was that cocaine-like substance that the brain gets as a reward. Well, dopamine levels increase with increased levels of testosterone and epinephrine, which leads the man to have focused attention, unwavering motivation, exhilaration, increased energy, hyperactivity, sleeplessness, loss of appetite, pounding heart, 
and accelerated breathing. To me, this sounds like Adam in search of Eve, right? That's where we are, and it's that moment where at last, this one is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called a woman because she was taken out of man. Dr. Helen Fisher says that romantic love is a primary motivation system in the brain, a fundamental human mating drive, and like all the other drives, romantic love is a need, a craving. And what she's talking about there, it's not first and foremost related to sex. It's related to this desire for love, this desire for communion. This falling in love, it's going to be expressed, yes, in a one flesh union. But first and foremost, it's this craving for romantic love, which is a craving for communion between a man and a woman. Well, in this moment where this man and this woman are drawn out of each other to become one, the father forges a union between them that is more than just a one flesh sexual momentary moment of sensual pleasure. And once more, this has all been written into the brain so that in fact our brains are going to become one even as our bodies become one. And what you find is the brain has a mechanism by which the boundaries between self and the beloved blur. And that is the posterior super, superior parietal lobe orients the person in space, and it's the ultimate on-off switch. This is Steve, none of that's Steve. Okay, well that's what my posterior superior parietal lobe does. But well, then I have a sympathetic system, which is what really controls my body's arousal system, and then a parasympathetic or a quiescent system, and that's kind of what works in tandem. But now it's all about the calming, okay, or soothing or stabilizing effect. Of course, during intercourse, what originally or initially dominates is that arousal system. And that's all about testosterone and adrenaline and everything you think about. What happens as that moment of climax approaches, well, then that arousal system is in such overdrive that the quiescent system is actually deprived of input. Well, the way things normally work in your body, when you deprive something of input, it kicks into overdrive because, like, man, you can't shut me off, I'll die. And so all of a sudden, this arousal system, it's walk, you know, operating at maximum output, and the quiescent system, when it becomes a private input, it kicks in. And all of a sudden, you simultaneously have the arousal system and the quiescent system both working in overdrive at this moment of climax, and that is what we call the ecstasy of communion where the person experiences simultaneous excitement and peace. Well, at that moment the mind is overwhelmed by all this input from both systems. And the prefrontal cortex, which is the attention area, is forced to operate at a maximum trying to sort out what's going on with all the stimuli that it's received. When that prefrontal cortex kicks into overdrive, what happens it's now the posterior superior parietal lobe, that's what orients Steve from everything else. Now that's the product of input. And all of a sudden, my ability to distinguish Steve and not Steve starts to blur. And suddenly my oneness with Shelley, the boundaries between Steve and Shelley blur, and Steve and Shelley seem to become one. A oneness in the brain, so more than just a oneness in the body, where my brain actually starts to take Shelley into myself. This gets us very close to that expression of Pope John Paul II, when he said, one flesh. How can we not see the power of this expression? What the spouses achieve is not only a joining of the bodies, but a true union of their person. A union which is so deep that it in some way makes them a reflection of the we of the three divine persons in history. Right? That's where we've been going this in the last several weeks. This is what we've been progressing towards this moment. And we're going to talk about this brain that's now going to accept another person into it 
It's going to actually accept that person into the same space that I've allotted to understand myself. And, it's, and this is all being restructured through the physical one flesh union. You know that honeymoon period where you know couples go away and they you know express that communion over and over and over again? Your brain is actually trying to learn a message. Then. Remember when you finally learned how to hear a golf swing? This is theoretical. I never learned the golf swing thing, but I've heard about it, okay? You learn it in a new town. And the first time you hit it right, immediately what your brain wants to do is practice it. You know, a thousand times again, so then your body, your muscles get that muscle memory, and then all of a sudden your drive will always work. This is what's going on during the honeymoon period. The brain is trying to learn something new, and what the brain is trying to learn is there's now another part of me. And this all happens, again, back to Dr. Helen Fisher. Romantic love is associated with subcortical dope energy pathways in the reward system. Romantic love is primarily a motivational system. Romantic love is distinct from the sex drive. We're being driven for communion. I mean, yes, the physical communion is a part of it, but it's beyond that. And specifically what's happening in the brain is the oxytocin, the vasopressin, and the dopamine released during intercourse restructures area in the brain, especially the lateral septum and the nucleus accumbens, to form what scientists call a paradigm. Where what Steve does is he allows Shelley to enter into my brain so that my brain now sees Steve and Shelley as a pair. And I do that by, believe it or not, letting her take over a part of my brain that I reserved for myself. And suddenly now, when I see this union here as part of who I am as this pair, well, that's when I had got this desire to make God. We talked about fool, which is the mercy I show my spouse. And as it says, sex is unlikely to be the driving force for selective aggression or make God. In other words, if it's just about sex, there's other ways to get sex. This is about, there's a union here, and just like I'm not going to let somebody hit me, I'm not going to let somebody hit my wife, because now my brain sees her as part of me. When we talk about that brain seeing her as part of me, well, what's happening is this restructuring of the brain forges a union between the husband and wife that transcends their material bodies. This greater closeness to the spouse increases neural activity in regions that are associated with the perception of self, specifically the middle insula and the anterior cingulate. These are the areas of my brain that, again, this is about steam. Well, all of a sudden, when I've got that physical human showing, that area increases and there's what's been described as a porosity, where now I've got the inclusion of the other person in self. And at that point in time, what happens is the brain, believe it or not, will respond, my brain, when I hear Shelley's name, my brain responds in the exact same area as when I hear Steve. That suddenly, I start to associate Shelley's name with myself. And suddenly, the person is merged in the brain so that the two truly become one. Now, as incredible as that is, that's not it yet, okay? Men and women both seek this moment of transcendence precisely when? When their bodies are open to an encounter with the Father, right? Men are more attracted to women, and women are more attracted to men precisely when the woman's body is near ovulation, which is when she can conceive a child, which he can express his fatherhood, which is ultimately a gift from God the Father himself. And so if you go back and you think about it, they are being driven towards this one flesh union precisely when they can receive the blessing of God. All the way back from that first square creation. And God blessed them, saying, increase and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowls of the air and all the creatures that move upon the face of the earth. Precisely when they can receive God's blessing is when they want to become one. And let's consider that blessing for just a moment. You know, once more, like with all these things we've looked at, you know, this whole fall, hidden behind the mundane 
there's a hole. But you know, these men just don't know why we're actually expressing a mystery. Women are expressing a mystery. Our union is expressing a mystery, and the child is going to express a mystery. There's a sign that we hear, of course, every time when we look at Christmas, which will be more before we know it, but we look at Christmas, that we always read out the prophet Isaiah. The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Well, we know that that verse applies, properly speaking, to the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the fact that she was a virgin when the Word became incarnate in her. So St. Joseph has no genetic matern uh, fatherhood over the Word of God. I will tell you, there's a secondary and subordinate meaning, meaning that nonetheless relates back to that primary fulfillment that relates to all women. That any time a woman receives a different child, it is a sign. And it's a sign that God is with us. In fact, that child embodies within himself the mystery of that whole union. The body of that child it's half its chromosomes from the man and half of its chromosomes from the woman. And they are fused together so that they're one. Just as the man and the woman are one in their union. And then God provides the spiritual soul. So that suddenly in this child, you have given the mystery of the Blessed Trinity. The man, the woman, two in one flesh, encountering God the Father. There's your Trinity. And the child becomes a sign of that moment. A sign of the communion. And it is the only thing worthy of that union is another person created the image of the of God. And I would go so far as to say this child is even in the form, if we could call it like this, of a sacrament. And that is the child actuates the mystery. On the one hand, the child flows from the union and as a sign of the union, but simultaneously, the child helps to actuate and bring about that union. So that as Dr. Brissendine says, having a baby was the best way for their brains and bodies to biologically pair bond and stay together for the long run. Look at data. Now this is uh, taken from the United States government. What you find is couples who have never had children are almost twice as likely to divorce as those who have had children. Data here is from the first five years of marriage, and people with kids, about 14%, get married uh, within, uh, get, excuse me, get divorced within five years, whereas for those who have never had children, about 29%, so almost 30%, get divorced within five years. So this child is not only a sign of that moment where the two become one in God, but he's also helping to actuate that moment so that he becomes, if you will, almost a sacrament of that moment. That is the one flesh union of man and woman. There is nothing else like it on earth. Next week, we'll see how through this union, man wants to give you the foretaste, God wants to give you the foretaste of paradise. As we bring our small groups, let's ask the questions. First of all, how can you better appreciate the spiritual reality of the union between man and woman? I understand all the physical goes on. We've been seeing here for several weeks, hidden behind the physical is the spiritual reality. How can you better appreciate that? The next thing is, how can you help our culture understand the spiritual reality behind the spouse of union? You know, our culture, just like everything, it wants to shrink the mind, it wants to shrink the heart, it wants to shrink the reality of the spouse of union, turning it just pleasure, turning away, making money, you know, not those things. How can you keep all of our society, help all of our society understand the identity, dignity of this one plus union? Let's close with prayer. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Dear Heavenly Mother, we thank you in a very special way for being with us to open up for us this mystery. In a very special way, you understand the beauty and the dignity of the union of man and woman created and called to become one flesh. Help each and every man in this room to live that dignity, 
Help them to praise God for having something that's unlike anything else on this earth. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. everybody. One, they give the science part of it, okay, for those intellectuals out there, and I know there's a few out there. Two, they give a theological background, and then three, it's for me. It's for like theology for dummies, okay, because I need it. Okay, so they get all those three areas in, in all those categories in each week. Um, what I like, uh, the, the one thing I think that you have to mention we do have, if you're interested in signing up for our group, uh, we're more than happy to have you. We meet here right here, 5.30, we, on Friday mornings, 5.30 to 6 is breakfast, 6 to 7 is a program. Uh, I know that there's some other parishes that are interested in getting this started. If you have an interest in getting this started, want to know how we did it, uh, get, get you in contact with people in Houston how to get it started, please see Matt and myself afterwards, and we can get you started in that. Now, the next part of the program is we usually break into small groups. Now, to describe this, this is where the core teams come in. If you're part of the core team, we usually have a, a table leader. And what the table leader does is he facilitates the conversation at the table using the facilitator's guide. So, you guys like to break into small groups right now? That can get us Real quick. Thank you, Dave. Um, we'll send out all of email with some information about how to start that ministry with bring different parishes. And also, I forgot to thank uh, everybody who helped make the Mass what it was today. So appreciate the music, the help of the music, the Eucharistic ministers, the electors, the, and everything. And thanks, Chris, for putting together the uh, scriptural rosary. That really gives it a nice little uh, touch to it. Makes it uh, special. Thank you, guys. And enjoy the questions. Uh, <laughs> 